And um, this week um, we have three sessions and this is the first of them. I'm, I'm really delighted to be joined um, in this session by two graduates from UCD Architecture, um, Ashling McCoy and Francis Matthews, and both of them um, making their way from architecture into the visual arts, uh, where they're both now enjoying an awful lot of success and making really uh, wonderful and significant work in their chosen mediums. Uh, for Ashling, the medium is largely photography, um, although um, not, not entirely. Um, and Ashling did a master's up in Belfast in the University of Ulster in photography, which I think served as a useful stepping stone into um, the, her current career. And she's making work um, here in Ireland and also um, I think around Europe um, and enjoying a lot of success. And then Francis also, um, again, um, studied architecture and then moved, I think quite quickly uh, into painting and has been um, making paintings now for more than 10 years, right? Um, and has a, had a number of very successful exhibitions. And as you were just hearing there, if you were listening in, is also currently being exhibited in both the RHA's show, the Royal Hibernian Academy's show, which is only um, accessible, but is accessible online. Uh, his own exhibition in the Molesworth Gallery was unfortunately um, <coughs> cut short by the lockdown. So, but there is a video that you can watch um, which maybe Francis will share some of, um, of, of the paintings in that exhibition. And there is actually an exhibition where his work is accessible, but not to anyone in Ireland, which is the, uh, the Royal Academy's annual show um, where uh, he, has, he has a couple of pieces, I think, Francis, or maybe one. Uh, just the one in the Royal Academy, yeah. So, so the idea for today is that Ashling, um, first Ashling and then Francis are going to talk a bit about their practice. And then we're going to have a conversation, hopefully, um, between the, the, the two of them and myself, particularly because I think both of them share an interest in the depiction of, um, of place and of how it is that we experience place. Um, so, you know, in which, and I suppose there's ways in which their training in architecture maybe manifests itself uh, in both of their bodies of work. So, Ashley, we're going to hand over to you first, uh, and then we go to Francis. So, Ashing, I'll go to you. Okay, thanks, you. Um, sorry, I'm just gonna. Hopefully, now these keynote things will work. Um, so hopefully, this is gonna just uh, animate here behind me. Um, because normally I just forget to to press uh, to forward on the slides. So this is just a um images from a the last uh iteration of a book project that I've been working on, and um, for a project in Berlin in the Temple off. Um. And yeah, as you said, I like I work mostly with photography and uh, I'm very like, I guess my education in architecture is sort of crucial to how I see the world, but also um, I'm very interested in the overlap between uh, architecture and photography. And I kind of see them almost as like paired disciplines um, in that, uh, well, at least when I was working as an architect, I was kind of just working in competitions and imagining places that didn't exist and generating images of them. And then it feels like as a photographer, I'm taking images of real places, but I'm kind of turning them back into, into an image or into, into a sort of concept of, of architecture. Um, so yeah, they both, I think both disciplines have this kind of um, uh, tie to the real world and also to the kind of ideal world. Um, yeah, so, uh, and also, I guess, also how, I mean, you guys are obviously, you know all about Yohani Palasma and um, lived space and all that, but like that images then also affect how we understand space and how we perceive space as well, because we're kind of constantly projecting all of those images of different places that we've we've experienced onto whatever we encounter. Um, so this project was made at the Tempelhof uh, Airport in Berlin. Um, and it's kind of a vehicle to talk about the refugee crisis. Um, so I started the project in 2016. So it was kind of at the height of the Syrian uh, situation in Syria um, and Germany. So the Tempelhof is a, an airport, a historic airport in Berlin. And um, so over this stage, of, over that year, I think there was something like a million refugees entered Germany. So um, and weirdly, when I was in Delft, I actually studied the Tempelhof building as a sort of precedent uh, for an architecture project. So I was aware it's it's not 
like my first my first reaction was in a way that this project is about if I'm interested in inhabiting um, and in the sort of uh, instincts to inhabit and imagine place, this is almost like a project about when that's re refused. Um, so like the, the first question I kind of came to mind when I heard that refugees were being uh, housed within the hangars, so it was like a temporary uh, emergency shelter really for them, um, was this question of the impossible question of how, how might you inhabit an airport? Because um, conceptually, it's it's sort of impossible as an architect. It's you know it's a, it's a place that's designed to move through. It's it's not something. It's not. It's kind of uh, dwelling there in both a movement sense and also a sort of an imagining imagining home sense is kind of impossible. Um, so yeah, the airport itself has a complex history because it was designed during Nazi Germany. Um, so it also has all these elements of like a fascist architecture architecture and sort of dehumanizing scale um, but then it also like it's kind of complex because then it was used by the allies during the uh, the Berlin airlift and then also recently it's become a park so it's like one of the most popular parks for Berliners um, but yeah there was this kind of utopic dystopic thing happening because you have obviously people uh, living in the hangars but you also have this park outside so um, I started to research a lot of Beckett while I was there because as a sort of reference, um, Waiting for Godot had been the only play that I'd seen, but uh, it felt like uh, it was the only sort of reference in terms of how to describe that kind of difficulty. Um, and it's kind of like they talk about Beckett's work as having like a failed form, that it, the formlessness uh, almost works in a way because it, it it translates that the experience of something as opposed to having an attitude about it or whatever um, and some of these images actually the archival images that I used uh, came kind of later in the project but they they gave me a way to deal with that difficulty that I felt in how to represent it and um, it's like it's obviously not a documentary project but it it is uh, it is sort of a moment in time and um, within a place um yeah so the the all, all the archival images are of returning german refugees that were also housed within the temple half after the second world war so i guess it sort of sets up this conflict between you know the, the historic and the current and you know the, the history of europe and the future of europe um as well as sort of looking at the architecture um that sort of refuses entry in a way that it's it's very um it has a certain ideology behind it. Um, so yeah, there's a, I'm just like, uh, Gilles Perez, Telex Aran was another reference, um, which is an amazing photo book based, and it, it again, it kind of deals with disorientation as a method of translating um, a, a sort of problematic rather than um, an experience. Um, so yeah, cause I felt like, you know, I, I, I know what a refugee center looks like and I, I did I obviously like met a lot of refugees and people who were there over the time but I felt that um it like showing what it looked like doesn't really represent the reality of it um or the reality of the people who live there it's kind of reduced um it, it's 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 kind of a simplified version of it um so then uh yeah within exhibition like obviously the layouts are kind of perhaps unusual for um for a normal photo book, but uh, I play a lot with collage and exhibition and I kind of brought that into the book this time as well. Um, I guess it's that sort of third space of images starting to combine to generate questions almost about, about a sort of, it's not really a narrative, but like, um, yeah, kind of narrative is the best way I can think about it. Or like how, how you start to build up an understanding of what's going on. Um, so yeah, so then uh, yeah, I'm trying to think of anything I've left out there. So yeah, it is. It's it's a it's a pro it's a project both about the difficulty of representing this experience that I haven't lived that I'm just trying to imagine, um, and also uh, how to how to how to generate that within a book form. Um, I can show you actually. I think there's a nearly nearly coming to the end of this um, I can show you also some sort of screen grabs of the exhibitions as well um, yeah sorry I, I was too worried about not to 
ta are taking up too much time. I think I'm after running through it too quickly. Yeah, there's, I guess there's three, there's different strands going on in the book as well. So like there's the natural spaces, there's the architectural spaces, and then there's the historic um, contrast of when it was last used as a, as a refugee center. Um, And I guess yeah, there's kind of like this kind of conflict set up with the, within them as well, and also this sort of sense of disorientation um, of things not really letting you in in terms of giving you a view, an overview of the space, or it's kind of all fragmented, um, which again is kind of deliberate. And then also I have actually have the book here somewhere. Um, yeah, so the book itself um, has a change in paper stock. So the, the cover and the, the first chapter and the second chapter are all on this quite a, very dark. Uh, it doesn't possibly represent that well in these PDFs, um, but the, it, they're printed on a dark paper. So like the first and last chapter are almost black. Um, they're kind of more, they're more visible really in this, but the, because the paper absorbs, um, absorbs the ink in that way, it kind of also, uh, it has this effect of being a kind of a dark introduction and, um, and yeah, so this is the, this is the end paper. So, uh, the gray area is actually where the cover, um, folds over. So, uh, the introductory text at the beginning and then the credits, uh, happen all on the cover. So that also on the cover, there's very little, um, to identify what's going on in the book. Um, and this is kind of the only, um, the only overview image, um, of a space and it, again it's a historical image so it's kind of suppose it's was way to maybe force a pause um on the viewer and um, so i'm going to just close this um and show you just quickly uh, i don't know so this is like some exhibition view so you can kind of see how um the idea of layering plate like layering um the distance between images kind of kind of works then and then it's something i've I kind of always work in tandem with the book and the exhibition kind of the same time. So they start to um, inform each other a little bit. So, oh yeah, the, these big grids as well um, were a way to make very big images, but they're, I'll get to one again. Um, they're, they're all printed on sort of office paper. So again, I suppose the, the means of making the exhibition was a way to, to talk about the bureaucracy of this sort of situation of being a refugee where it's not just about a physical restraint, it's also about the time and um, effort involved in, in working through that, that system um, of, of gaining entry to, to Europe and almost kind of gaining entry to a future because it's a very short term uh, situation that they're in until they get, they get given asylum. Um, yeah, so that's that. Um, and so then, those, those images, those large images are pr printed on individual on like a4 sheets is it Alan? yes they're just they're all a4 sheets so i suppose it like particularly that i mean it like it also the architecture of the space is incredibly heavy and kind of repetitive and like incessant almost so i suppose that was a it was a means to kind of hammer that home a little bit as well um so it, you kind of you're kind of uh made quite aware of the fact that it is um it is it is yeah, it, the scale of it, I suppose, as well, because that's, I mean, that's the, I, I'm not sure, yeah, obviously you can probably count the A4 sheets, but it's, uh, it's probably near to th three metres, two and a half metres, whatever. Um, they kind of vary depending on the exhibition, so some are taller than others, depending on the gallery wall. Um, so it kind of expands, I think there's a different image then in the one in Dublin. Um, yeah, so that, that was another, I guess the, yeah, there's also, I also use these vinyls so I can I can stick up a much larger um, image on the wall and kind of overlap them as well. Um, now I will go to my keynote again. So the second uh, project I'm going to talk about is a really um, really recent one. I um, I was based in France last year and I I kind of joked that I came back for the plague. Um, so I. I was back living with my parents in Kildare um, and it's it was kind of a weird situation because obviously I'm like approaching 40 so I was restricted in this place that um, 
I knew very well, but kind of had a completely different perspective on as an adult. Um, and it, it kind of reminded me, of, like, um, also when I was in the Netherlands, um, we covered Freud's Das and Heimlich, so like the, the uncanny, like, so and it's almost like a more affecting horror because of the, it's the familiar becoming strange as opposed to the external becoming strange. Um, and I mean, all of, the, all of this is kind of infused with COVID and this sort of risk of, uh, you know, the threat of COVID, uh, this invisible threat that sort of can infect your house or whatever. Um, so I suppose I, I was working on these project. I was working on this project almost as a sort of, um, just a means to kind of understand it again. Um, but I also started, in a way, I guess, to, to mark the time and, and the place and um, I think everybody probably had the COVID experience of like being forced to look like in a way this project is about looking in as much as it is about the house um, and it's kind of like we're forced into this very slow method of looking where we were more aware of seasons and like uh, light and how, how time sort of uh, yeah I kind of like a more a more sustained attention towards time and slow time. Um, so I also started making these little sculptures, um, like pretty intuitively, but I guess they, they, they were, um, I sort of understand them as being like uh, uh, studies on uh, enclosure or like how, I guess also as somebody working with photography, it's, it's such a surface thing, you know, it, it, it doesn't have, and somebody who maybe was trained to make tangible, uh, permanent, big things. Um, I kind of wanted to push that a little bit and make make things that were very ephemeral um, and that only kind of existed within the photograph in a way. Um, so this like I it's something that I kind of enjoyed and I, I want to continue. Um, and I guess it also ties back into this idea of inhabiting where like that, you know, architecture is, you know, you're projecting ideas onto things um, and that maybe through making these little interventions or little sculptures that I can kind of engage more with that side of my my background as well um, so next year I have I've kind of got a project lined up where I'll work with a composer and a designer and a poet um, and we'll do a series of workshops where we'll uh, look at spaces and this sort of ephemerality of architecture so you know how like light and time and um, and sound and how how architecture can kind of contain those things um, so it's kind of an open-ended project, but um, and it's kind of, I've kind of, uh, I suppose the fact that I'm working with other people as well allows me to kind of lose control in a way that kind of will hopefully be very creative. Um, yeah, so that's, I think that's kind of the last image or whatever. So again, yeah, it's kind of a documentary project, but it's very, I'm probably becoming more, um, more of an editor of what I'm seeing and kind of constructing things a little bit more. I think we're at the end. One more wraps. Oh no, there's a couple more actually. <laughs> so yeah, I guess uh, I like when I was in Paris, I um, I went to a James Case Beer. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that right, but he's an American uh, photographer who makes these large scale models and then photographs them. And that was kind of a, an important exhibition for me during that time. Um, so yeah, I'm kind of excited about doing doing more of that kind of playful work um, and seeing where that goes. Thanks, Andrew. Thanks. Yeah, sorry. I'll no, just cancel sorry, you've got a couple more images, I think, or maybe that's the last yeah, one. Yeah, actually, the, the next one is the last one, yeah. And is that is that work ongoing, or I suppose you're, you're saying it's going to take a different path now? Food. yeah like in a way like this is a kind of a mix this project because it was like it was a lot about the house and um, but it's also I'm sort of making that's the last that's the last slide now um because I was kind of making these little structures and um, it kind of sent me on another direction mm -hmm. so the new project then will more than like, like I have to figure all that stuff out but um because the people I'm collaborating with are in different countries as well so also with COVID I don't know how that's going to work but yeah it's more like I guess it's a smaller like I figure that it's something that I can play around with in a studio um, and kind of generate wherever I am yeah um so yeah I'm kind of happy that it's kind of open though as well so it can it can lead in whatever direction it wants to to um 
Ashley, there's going to, I'm sure I have loads of questions. I'm sure there will be others, but I think what we will do is we'll go to Francis and then we'll come back and maybe have the conversation at the end, if that's okay. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Thank you. I mean, it's wonderful to see that work. And I know Steph has linked the um, people to your website where a lot of that work is, is, is collected. Is the, is the book that you showed, is that out yet? Um, I should no, not. It's, it's just a dummy. I keep making sort of small dummies for different exhibitions, so it kind of changes all the time. Okay. Um, I don't know whether it will get published really, to be honest, um, but uh, it's kind of been a means to an end so far. Okay, so. well, hopefully it's next. I mean, yeah, see it come out. Um, Francis, can we go to you and sure? Somebody yeah. else has been kind of well, I suppose you, you always just stay in your studio and paint, so maybe COVID has not had my, my work day hasn't really changed. No, yeah. 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 <laughs> walk around empty streets at night, yeah, yeah, it's uh, yeah, nothing, it hasn't changed much for me. <laughs> okay. Um, I don't know what that says about my work, but uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, it's COVID proof anyway. Well, <laughs> um, I oh yes, I'll, I'll share. I'm just going to talk a little bit about uh, my process, and and it's it's changed a little bit in the last uh, two years. I've, I've um, altered how I work a bit, and then I'll I'll talk about a few of the recent paintings. Um, so a reminder just as Francis starts just if you have questions and I know there's one from Alice to Ashling and I'll come to that I'll try and gather them at the end and um, you know get some responses but Francis over to you. Um, so I'm, I'm an oil painter and I, I paint from photographs that I take around the city at night mostly and um, I look for places where the dynamics of light play an important role in the perception of the spaces and First, I'll explore them through photographing. I'll crop the photographs in different ways to explore different compositional qualities. And then I'll paint with the use of the photographs. Sometimes changing small parts and sometimes combining several photographs. And the painting is a fairly slow, meticulous process of, of close observation. Um, and normally um, after, after I print out photographs, I will, in, in the process of, of painting them, I'll, I'll put a grid on the photograph, I'll figure out any perspective points, and um, then I will uh, get a, a canvas that's the right proportions. I'll prime that canvas black, I'll put a grid on the uh, an equivalent grid on the, on the black canvas, and then um, I'll share the screen here. The first layer we put on can, can you see that okay? Yeah. Yep. First layer I put on is roughly blocking in all the, everything in the right proportions and using the perspective points. And I'll, at that stage as well, I'll, I'll figure out the right amount of courses of, of bricks and stone. And a lot of the uh, detail, a certain amount of the detail I'll, I'll figure out at this point because it's a lot harder at, at the next stage. Um, this will all be in, in quite a thin layer of paint. So it's, uh, it dries quite quickly. Then I'll, when that's dry, I'll start moving across in the more detail there. So that's uh, takes a lot longer, um, and it's it's. I'll, I might work on an area that's about ten by ten centimeters for a day to get that uh, as precise as I like it to be, and all kind of the colors that are beside each other, I like to be, I don't like harsh lines between adjacent colors. So they're all blended to each other uh, in different degrees. And I'll move across the painting until I get to quite a finished uh, painting. Like this is, this is a large one that would take uh, eight weeks or so to do. Um, and so more recently I've tried uh, a different way. I've kind of combined that uh, the first two those two steps together into the one um, step where I will uh, prime the canvas black, put the grid on, and then uh, begin the, the, the one and only layer of oil paint. So this is the finished layer directly onto it without that rough layer underneath. And when I'm doing this, I leave the black parts exposed. So it's using the negative space um, for all the dark areas of the painting. 
and you can see kind of as I'm working across here, I still use the grid to um, help me get everything in the correct proportions. And it's with this this way of painting, it's um, I'm I'm using it for smaller paintings, and it's a little more gestural. You can see some of the brush strokes in it a bit more. It's it's harder to be more precise in this way of painting because I'm because I'm exposing the primed layer, and um, I can't correct anything that goes wrong in that part of it. And I leave the the grid visible in that black area as well. So it's it's revealing part of the process and it's it's kind of um, diverging a bit more from the photographic source. It's making the painting more of a thing itself. Um, so that's that's the way I've been painting a bit lately. And the primed black surface is a matte finish. The oil paint is a glossy finish. So it's hard to see on this one, but in reality, when you see see the paintings, it's it's clearer that the two different finishes, and it kind of unifies all this darker area here, which I quite like in some of the images where this dark area, which is is the background, the sky back here, becomes kind of middle ground of the road. It becomes the lower part of a lamppost here, and it will move into the foreground down here. And it's all fairly unified by the finish and by being able to see the grid. You can't see it that much in this photo of this painting, but in, in reality, you see the, the pencil line of the grid a little bit more. So I kind of like the, there's a little bit of tension between the flatness of all that black and the, the depth of the actual image. Um, and and I like that it's, it's in this particular image, um, it's playing a little bit with the ability to, to uh, distinguish kind of foreground and background, like the, the brain can figure out from context exactly what's going on, even though it's all a single continuous area of black in those ones. So that's kind of the, how uh, the process has changed a little bit in the, re in, in the last two years. I'm doing more for the smaller paintings. For the larger ones, I'm still, um, I still enjoy both ways of painting and they're both doing different things a little bit. So. Uh, um, I do use both. And in, in all the paintings, there's a couple of different elements that will motivate me to paint it. There's kind of uh, the spatial compositional qualities of a place, how it depicts depth and the dynamics of light in it. And there's also maybe a, a narrative element to them. They can be a little bit like empty film sets. They're providing a space where a scene is about to unfold or documenting a place where something has just happened. And usually all these elements are, are in an image in some ways, but in some, uh, some of them might be more prominent in some images than others. So I'll show some recent paintings where it's a bit more prominent. In this one here, this is a painting of the Inchicore College of Further Education in Inchicore, which was inspired by falling water, I think. Um, and this one, um, for me, it's, it's, it's more uh, focused on kind of a graphic compositional quality uh, of the place and the dynamics of the light and how that helps to perceive the depth in the image. In this one, the, there's not, perspective doesn't help so much in perceiving the depth of it. Um, there's a little bit of overlapping, which can help you see the depth, but, but the main way you perceive the depth is from the fading light. Um, normally, light from a street light is fairly, it fades consistently across it, but here there's big steps in the gradation of light each time, each, each uh, with each of these blocks stepping back. And as well, there are uh, two shadows from the lamppost, one coming from the, the close source of light. And then there's another street light across the road. And with each step back, those two uh, shadows of the lamppost separate further, uh, further and further, kind of a big step each time. And I think all those kind of contribute to helping 
perceive the depth of it. So that kind of a very, um, not simple, but it's, it's a, a solitary light source doing quite a lot in that place. And it's, it's, I like that it's, it's kind of coincidental that there's this vertical element breaking up all these horizontal blocks. Um, so a lot of the time I will, when I'm out looking for things to photograph, I will uh, look for these kind of coincidental uh, compositions about. Um, yeah, and here's another one, which is probably quite a bit about, like the, the composition of it was what struck me when I came across it. It's very simple. There's a lot of emptiness to it. Um, there is, it is providing kind of two distinct places, a uh, foreground and a middle or background here. And they're distinguished uh, a bit more by the different colors of the lights as well. And they're separated by a kind of thin band of, of darkness there. Um, but the main thing that struck me when I came across this was that kind of coincidence of two strong vertical lines here a lot of different diagonals coming in different ways. And then this one curved line here. Another thing that I quite liked in this as well was a very, like very minimally kind of suggesting the, the facades of the, the facade of the building here by outlining the windows and doors. And these are just, when I'm painting them, they're just like little objects floating in the void, but the brain will kind of complete the picture, you know. Um, another quite, well, not really present in that, but is present in other ones are, is to do with uh, the texture and materiality of a place. So this, uh, this one here is, is George's Street intersecting with Dame Street. And there's a lot going on in this. The, the wet surface of the road kind of amplifies and picks out different elements of the texture of the worn tarmac and the, and the broken road markings and the, all the different uh, sources of light, different types of, of light uh, reflecting off it and illuminating the road in different ways gives a real kind of rich variety of um, uh, representations of the texture as you move across it. There's, there's a, there was a lot, there was a very rich uh, variety of things going on in the texture of the road there and the way I, I like that the kind of sharpness of the outlines of all the textures here contrasts a bit with how the light kind of fades on the upper facades of the building of the buildings um, this is this is quite a large one this is in the RHA at the moment and we'll see if uh, we can get to see it in person at some point point. Um, and then this was another painting that's in um, in the exhibition I had in the Molesworth. Um, I've kind of I've always been struck by when uh, streetlights kind of coincidentally happen to be up against trees at night, and they give this really dramatic light. It's it's um, it's very striking, as well as uh, the tree kind of dispersing the light that's coming from the, the street light as well. Like on the road, the, the, the light is modified quite a lot by these, by filtering through all the branches. And part of the reason that I, I was, uh, wanted to paint this was again from, by the way depth is depicted in it. Perspective isn't used to portray depth, um, but overlapping and the fading and changing colors of light and the directions of shadows are kind of the tree elements that um, depict depth in the tree. So those I kind of like when I hap I'll happen upon um, places that are, are doing different things with how you perceive depth from, uh, yeah, but in this case, kind of removing the perspective part of it, but using other parts and it's it's a little bit of a is um the, the challenge of painting it as well like this was doesn't look like it might be but it, it was technically uh, tricky to do um but that's maybe that was a few paintings that i was going to talk about if uh 
uh, there's that's that's four of no there were three of those paintings are in the exhibition I had recently um and the other one in the RHA. yes the other one in the RHA um but yeah that's thanks Francis um that's all you're going to give us right you you're you're teasing us to go onto your website and <laughs> <laughs> um, there's there is that video of of the that shows all the exhibitions. I'll, I'll uh, I can try to find the link and share it in the chat. Um, yeah, I think that was that's very interesting. Um, I, I, thank, I mean, actually, it's really beautiful to see uh, both bodies of work. You know, just coming on our screens at lunchtime is just a treat in a very simple, way. <laughs> very at a very, very straightforward level. I think it's just a treat. I saw a lot of smiling smiling faces. Um, there's questions. Alice has questions for both of you. I might, I mean, I'm, I'll, I will, we'll come to them. That Alice, don't worry. <laughs> Maybe I might let, just let you jump in, actually, Alice, and ask the question. I, I had a question for both of you, which is the. Well, I had about twenty questions for both of you, actually, but one would be about the sustaining of a practice, or the sort of development, and then the definition and the sustaining of a practice. You know, in other words, because to me, that's one of the challenges of of working as an artist is how do you know what you do? How do you know the terms on which you do it? How do you know, how do you develop technique and decide which technique you're going to use in a particular moment at a particular place? Like, it seems to me that that's an, is that something that you are always reviewing in your own mind that becomes clear at times, ah, this is how I do things. Or, you know, is, do you have to deliberately stop yourself and think, um, or do you know what you're going to get, you know, do, and again, are there moments when you sort of think, no, this is not working anymore. I need to work differently now. Sorry, it's a very open question to both of you. Maybe just some initial thoughts on it. Ashley, do you want to go <laughs> first? Being an artist. <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> okay. Now, you go first, Ashley. Okay. Right. <laughs> um, but it, it definitely, it started, just, uh, well, I started painting when I was quite young, in my teens, uh, um, but uh, watercolours and, kind of not formally trained so was was painting a, a more intuitive way I suppose um, and I didn't question it too much uh, when I started going full-time painting and um, when I finished uh, college I decided to take a year out to paint full-time and, and if nothing else I'd improve my technique and it went well enough to continue painting and it was only after like after a few years of being quite comfortable in that way of painting and uh, figuring out uh, things by mistake, by trial and error, a lot of the ways, I did try to push myself in, in a few different ways. Like the two years ago when I kind of changed my process, that was a, some experimentation in part because I was uh, felt like I was maybe getting repetitive or or I wanted to just uh, explore a different route as well you know and I, I've, I have taken a little bit of time out to uh, to try very different ways of painting but I haven't like I haven't uh, found them successful. <laughs> well, uh, so, so worked quite a lot with film haven't you Francis you've done yeah film anyway. Yeah. yeah no film film is is great so it's, it's well a very different medium um, to painting but there's there's a lot of uh lots of scope for um do, sim, exploring similar grounds to what I'm, i am doing in painting but it's, it represents it in a very different way you know so the time element is, is a lot um stronger in it and, and sequence and stuff like that i think uh, ashling do you've done some film stuff as well though haven't you yeah, I'm kind of I've dabbled, to be honest. It's something that I'm really interested in. Um, and hopefully this year there's scope to do a bit more of that as well. But um, I think I, I suffer just from like attention deficit disorder or something, I think. Like, I think honestly, Hugh, like for, to answer, to, like I, I think if, from, from my perspective, I think it's just time that like you try loads of different things and then there's kind of you start to see patterns emerging and then you kind of get bored of the pattern <laughs> you try and change the pattern but like I think you know it's like even your your thesis in, in fifth year in architecture do you know where somebody's like constantly asking you what your thesis is and you're just like I don't know and it seems like regardless of what medium you're working in 
you kind of get dragged back to it. So like, I don't know, for me, I think it's, um, it's kind of something you can't really avoid. It's just sort of something you're trying to, like some question you're trying to answer within yourself and you can, like you can approach it in different ways, but it kind of, if it's from you, it's sort of, it has a consistency to it. But um, I definitely think applying for stuff, like doing applications really forces, it's kind of a good, for me, it's quite good because it forces me to like put it down on paper and actually nail my my colors to the mast a bit. And because up until you have to describe something, I think it can be quite, uh, would it be would it be a familiar pattern then for say like a body of work like the one you showed the lockdown stuff to emerge from circumstance say and then at a certain mm -hmm. point you name it and you say oh maybe this is a project or or do you sort of set out say no 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 I'm gonna now I want to start making work about this condition or this place or does it vary yeah like personally I don't come with the it's kind of intuitive at the beginning and like because I have loads of things going like loads of small projects that never turn into anything and then some of them just like I, I work because I kind of make little books I'll always like put it into a sequence and like and things then start to emerge um and then yeah sort of yeah I think people work different ways I definitely work I make the work first and then I put a shape on it and the shaping is a kind of collaging a lot of the time or in various ways like and also or this is my read of it mm. that it's it's kind of elliptical but but also quite direct you know so there's direct elements that are combined together and then sometimes quite direct references or sources you know like found archival and you i know to you 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 refer to quite a lot of other things like Gilles perez and beckett and so there's a lot of let's say things being referenced in the work and being gathered. So it feels like a kind of gathering, I suppose, is what I mean, of, of ingredients or elements or something. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And like, I think there's a kind of constant process of, like I think personally for me, like other photographers work in different ways and other artists work in different ways, whatever. But for me, I kind of like the photography in a way isn't really the point of it. Like it's kind of, it's that edit that I feel that the, the work comes together. Um, and it, that kind of gets exciting because it does take on its own shape and then things start to feed in and you start to, yeah, I think like emerging is probably the best way I can describe it. Like that it, it's almost like I'm not fully in control because there's an element of like yeah. happening that, that occurs as well. And is that it just, I know, well, we're going to go to Alice now in a minute, but just to milk that a little bit more, is that always you, also your, let's say, desired response on the part of an audience? is that they get a, a sort of an emerging or cumulative sense, say, of a project, mm -hmm. like the Temple Hill project I'm thinking of. Because the, it's all, uh, yeah. you know, it's suggestive. It's, it's never direct in terms of, as, as a depiction, let's say, of a place or a condition, but it, it's suggesting it through fragments and elements. And I mean, is that is that, something that you're thinking about how is somebody going to encounter this make sense of it yeah it's kind of it's always kind of hard to um it's always kind of hard to figure out because i i don't really want to tell people what to think about things but um i do want to translate some sort of an understand like not an understanding but like a feeling like particularly with the temple of project like i there was a lot of pressure like to represent that fairly um and it, it also wasn't my story like so it's quite subjective it's not a documentary um project but I did I, I felt like um it was my duty to translate that kind of frust like that feeling of um disorientation or of frustration of not of being between not being able between here and there really like not being able to go forward or back yeah um so yeah like I mean I definitely like struggled a bit over how best to uh to suggest that and that's where like Becca came out of it because I was kind of just at the end of my I didn't know how to do it and I was kind of I'd signed up to an exhibition or whatever um and I felt like that I needed to do right by the people that had helped me and I'd met and um but it, it was almost like I guess for that project as well I was kind of I'm trying to figure out how I understand things as well so I, I don't know how consciously I'm it's more like 
I don't know how consciously I'm thinking of somebody looking at it. It's more like I need to get the story straight for myself or have it have a clarity to it. And that's um, that's what the exhibition is about, is that clarification. Yeah. Yeah, because like again, there's different ways of telling it. Like it works in the book, but then it has to change when it turns into an exhibition where like on a website it's a different edit again. And um like I'm sure, like I, I'm sure it's the same for Francis and that like, you know, I mean, like his work is more about a physical object in a way, perhaps, but um it's it does change like depending on which ex which expression space it's in. I'm sure the the edit kind of changes around a bit. Yeah. And one of the things that's interesting about and uh, Francis, one of the things that's interesting about Francis is, is, is that your reading of them, like on the surface, literally, I guess, they're kind of straightforward as, as a proposition. I'm painting nighttime scenes based on photographs. They're realistic mm -hmm. and so on. But what's interesting is the minute, the minute you start to think about that, it starts to unravel, like the way that you talked about. And it, beca it's, it becomes much more about how we see and how we remember. Uh, all, there's all sorts and foreground and background and you reference perspective a lot so the, I'm struck by how your close awareness of the process you know and what it is you're achieving in the painting isn't isn't necessarily very apparent to the viewer at, at first maybe but then but then when they start to think about it and even things like the matte surface versus um, whatever the opposite of matte is <laughs> shiny but um that sort of thing is it does say no, no, no. This is more complex than than you than you think, or it, it and indeed all pictures are more complex than we think. All right, that's a ramble, Francis. I don't know if you were to respond to that. Well, I, I I'd say I'd say a lot of it is because yeah, because I spent so long with them. You know, I I I've, uh, my attention is drawn to parts that. Uh, wouldn't be it, on your on your on first inspection they, they wouldn't be the most obvious parts that jump out to you but um probably some of some of those that that first uh first look quality is what what strikes me first when i when i'm taking the photo but then as i yeah as i delve deeper in there's uh there's a lot more that i, I get interested by and and kind of that i'm focused on for throughout the, the whole painting of it you know I'm going to go, Alice, is it okay to go to you to, do you want to ask those questions or do you want me to paraphrase? Um, yeah, no, I can ask them. Um, just thanks very much, both of you, for your presentations. It's just so wonderful looking at and hearing about such beautiful work. Um, my question is quite boring for both of you, but it's kind of been related to technique and how much that forms a part of your practice. So I'm really interested in what technique, how it can inform Kind of how we work and then how people understand our work and I was just interested with in yours Ashleen about that thing about digital manipulation and kind of manipulation after the, the photography and how much that actually forms a part of your work and um, and then with Francis I was interested in your photographic practice and you know how much like for me looking at it the way you make images makes me think about architectural photography and the kind of the tropes of architectural photography you know the kind of the grid and the kind of the, the setting up the structure of the image and the kind of composition so i was just wondering in both for both of you about that that aspect of technique in your work ashley um yeah i'm like i'm kind of i'm not i'm kind of free with it like if it works i kind of see the images as almost like words or something and i'll i'll use a different phraseology or i'll you know i'll use some lighter or whatever than if i need to um, so I, I manipulate nearly everything. I mean, um, and I crop things after I've taken them and I'll, I'll do whatever needs to be done in a way that so that the edit is as strong as it can be. I, um, I'm also probably quite technically like not the best photographer in the world. So I'm kind of like, oh, I'll, I'll fix it later, you know. Um, but like for the Temple of Project, like, for example, I kept a lot of the images deliberately dark um, because that would sort of it just as a I suppose it's like a uh you know it gives a tone to the overall to the overall series whatever so are you thinking like when you're saying i'll fix it later like that actually the manipulation of the image is as much a part of your thinking about the formation of it sometimes when you're working yeah but, like uh, i mean and a lot of the time that they change like uh, the crop yeah. will change down the line or um like it's uh 
yeah I'm kind of like I'm kind of like I, even like I'll, I'll photoshop things out if mm. if I don't like if they if I feel they're distracting or whatever um I'll I'll do lots of like I'll straighten things if they need to I um I kind of like yeah I'm not because also I've kind of I, I'm not I'm not saying it's documentary photography so I'm kind of like once you say that you're kind of free to do what you want um so or I figure you know like that uh I don't have to like it's not about like it's not about the the sort of honesty of that it's about the story you tell around it or it's about like if it works for the edit then it doesn't really like for me it doesn't matter um it's really interesting and do you think that relates a little bit to your architectural training and the kind of creation of an image that you spoke about earlier um, in your presentation. Do you think like um, part of it is because you're trained in creating and imagining space as well? Yeah, possibly. Like, I mean, I, it, it might also just be like, <laughs> maybe the influence of going to a school that's very focused on documentary photography and just getting like, you know, just kind of just going, no, I, I want to do something <laughs> like, I, you know, um, I don't know. I mean, um, but then I think also photography is changing a lot in that, um, you know, and even like, you know, it's kind of, it's kind of distancing itself from uh, photography and media or where there is a restrict, like there is a restriction mm -hmm. for very good reasons that like, you know, Gilles Perez, when he was making Telex Iran could not edit any of those images because he's mm -hmm. working for a newspaper. Um, and in a way that's what made that book so extraordinary because he just kind of went AWOL and then sent in these really like confusing images. Um, but, and it, it like, I guess, yeah, that was kind of a seminal like piece of work, a reference for me when I was studying photography as well. And um, that, you know, the overall edit or the overall sort of piece together was what was important, not like kind of indiv individual images. Mm. Um, yeah, and I guess like I work a lot in digital, so it's kind of like it's part of the process anyway. And even if, even if I was shooting on film, I'd still come, I'd still color correct and everything mm. in digital. So I kind of like, I got into photography as a digital, like not digital native necessarily. I'm a bit too old for that, but like, um, yeah, like I like you say, like when I was working as a, as an architect, I was kind of putting people into Photoshop files, you know. So yeah. uh, I'm kind of used to it, and I kind of feel like it's it's all a lie anyway Do you know I don't mm. think photography is such a construct that like yeah. um I feel that there's not really I feel I can get away with it um, mm. if I want to change things so I mean a lot of the time I don't but I don't have a problem with it mm. um if I need to so I'm just putting up a link to um Alex Iran oh yeah, yeah it's a great book but it's really it's a very hard book to find so yeah um, I'm gonna just I made a link to Magnum where they, they have a page on it in the chat for those who are interested. Um, Francis, you're not getting away without answering Alice's question. Damn. <laughs> um, um, well, with the, I'm, I'm not a good photographer at all. I, I use my phone I camera. To differ. <laughs> <laughs> I know I, I, I use my, my phone camera and I'll take because the photographs were just no good so <laughs> but I, t I take a lot I take lots and lots of photos um the, and I, a few years ago I, I used to use cameras that were purposely not great quality so I would get some noise in it so I'd have some ambiguity to play with in the in the translation of the photograph to the painting um but as as better cameras became easy easy more readily available in phones, I did get a better quality camera. So there is less visual noise in it, but I, and I, I will kind of modify settings and stuff. In, in the one place in the setup, I'll change color temperatures of things and, and uh, shutter speed and a few different elements. And um, this will kind of artificially re reduce down the image sometimes, you know, it'll make, it'll make increase the areas of darkness, which in reality, weren't like that but it, it, um, visually in the, in the image when I'm going through them on the computer is um, they strike me more you know so I will kind of uh, play with the, the a few of those uh, settings at that stage and then after printing printing them out I will kind of modify some things from the image onto the painting you know well first they, they won't I won't exactly get all the colors right anyway so 
in my attempts to to get it close it'll it'll change itself and then i will modify certain things like what you're saying about architectural photography mm. where you're, you're correcting splayed mm. lines and stuff mm. like that mm. but I, I i quite like that in in the painting in relation to kind of like the edges of the of the paint you know parallel edges and kind of there's a, a graphic element to the composition that i i like in your mind are you then sort of responding to photographic vision rather than trying to render actual vision i mean like i'm thinking of the way you often have quite extreme foreground let's say in your images mm. you, know, you have something sitting slightly out of focus almost right at the front of the picture plane if you like and then fading going back into dark in a way that you wouldn't register the scene with it pictorially or uh, yeah it's something to do with the particular vision you get from the camera that, that you're enjoying that you then render is that fair to say or yeah yeah no for sure that, that uh, the camera's more is is is, uh, is picking up kind of a complex spatial thing that that you wouldn't register really like you you're not looking at the near and far at the same time in reality you know what I always find about your paintings is that there's so many places in them mm. that I recognize just like and not recognize just oh I know where that is but recognize deeply as in I have I know exactly what that is. <laughs> That, like everybody knows that corner of Dame Street and George Street, yeah. it's not quite as deserted as in your, you know, <laughs> yeah, really late at night or early in the morning, um, like. But still, it's and it, not in in a really visceral sort of sense. It connects, you know, and then you think it's so nondescript, but mm. it's so specific. And, and even the one with the, which is, I think, taken in Donnybrook, if mm -hmm. I'm not. Like a traffic, there's a traffic lights next to it. Yeah, yeah. Right about there. So that's like that particular place in all its specificity. Kind of, there's something interesting about you paying so much attention to some the thing that is so non script. Yeah, like, it's deliberate as well. In fact, the the, the Inchicore painting is kind of unusual now in that regard. It's quite a striking piece of architecture, and you don't usually go for that kind of thing. I I don't know. I am. Um... I had that photograph just sitting on my wall for a good year before I decided to to try it as a painting because I really liked it as as, as an image, uh, but it is quite different to to the usual ones. Yeah. Holding off on, there's a, a slightly oh, yeah. question here, I think, from Steph, who's yeah. kind of wondering, would you ever consider paint, painting a daytime scene? I I have done some. Yep. Yeah. Um, I I quite like. Uh, you have it. Yeah. Go on. Sorry. I, yeah, <laughs> I probably do the um, maybe one daytime, one once a year or every two years. <laughs> so not not very often, but it's it's rarer that I come across a, a daytime composition which has the life, right. Life as a vampire pretty much precludes it. <laughs> yeah, I, I burn up in the sun for one. Thing. I feel like um like my my question was kind of on the back of um like the early stages of lockdown when like. Mm -hmm. There was a lot of images, at least I saw, like of of, and I experienced like just empty streetscapes, mm -hmm. in the middle of the day. And I just wonder because, like, I I feel like that that sort of has the same atmosphere of what you're capturing in your nighttime scenes, and the fact that like there's no people around, like there's this degree of of, of liminality to it, which I feel like I I don't know if if you recognize that like there could have been an opportunity to go around like in April or May and find things to paint. I don't know. There was, although there's, there's definitely a similar atmosphere, but there's probably a few elements uh, of an image that will make me want to paint it. And, and one of them is, is usually the light in it. Mm. And it's harder to, for me to find things happening in daytime light that I find as intriguing as the nighttime stuff. I suppose. Yeah, yeah. But there's definitely that similar, the empty atmosphere of the streets is, it was, there's, that similarity is there for sure. Mm. Which is something that, Ashling was picking up on in a way as well, and that that kind of or your Ashling in your case it was about the uncanny, the mm -hmm. sense the, familiar, the unfamiliar familiar, or the the familiar rendered slightly um, strange and a little bit menacing. That that was the kind of initial initial prompt for that series, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but also actually in the temple half, I think the minute you start putting people into things, 
it starts to generate a different question as well. Like, you know, you start to have protagonists and you can't help but project onto them. Mm. Um, so yeah, I think there's probably a reason why uh, it can be more difficult. Like it depends on what you're trying to do, but yeah, people can sometimes mess with things. You know? <laughs> <laughs> you have people in yours, do you? I am um, years ago, you might see a silhouette of, of somebody in the distance, but uh, not in the last few years now. Can I ask just about, about I mean, uh, this is a banal question in a way, and I know we have to finish in a minute, but just um, about influences or artists that you look to, whose work interests you, mm -hmm. you follow, <coughs> Francis. I mean, or, or, or is it um, is I'd that, say, that important to you, you know? Um, I'd say there might have been more influence from like filmmakers okay. uh, than other visual artists. Because like the, the visual arts that I, a lot of the visual art I'm drawn to isn't like what I paint, you know? So, um, but similar to what I paint is probably uh, film related stuff, you know? Okay. Like yeah. the usual. So like the, the sort of stuff. Yeah, but so this, the sort of super realists or whatever they are, like Richard Estes and people like that, that's not uh, uh, particularly... I don't really like Richard Estes. This, this is too... It's it's a little too sharp for me, you know? Um, but there's there are some of them that I really like. I can't remember his name now, but he does... I think he uses a, an airbrush and it's um, a lot of these kind of cars in, in fields and stuff. I can't remember his name now. But there, there's some of the realists that I, that I do like, but when it gets too sharp and too clear, there's something that uh, I find off-putting. But so not necessarily, I mean, in other words, it's not necessarily that, that, you know, that you're thinking, well, I'm operating in this territory, so therefore these are my fellow, it's actually more broad than that or more, for different reasons, you align on different people. I, th I think so, yeah, yeah. Ashley, what about you? Um, yeah, there's. I think. I think the thing is that, like, I'm attracted to different people's work for different reasons. So, um, I don't. Yeah, I don't. I'm, I'm sure there's lots of work that probably looks very similar. Um, but I think if I was to like, God, I'm putting me on the spot now. I don't know. Like, I mean, there's there's so many uh, references. That... Whether you whether that's a sort of engine for your work. You know what I mean? Yeah. You know, I will say. While I'm writing, while I'm writing a novel, I don't read anything because I don't want to be whatever. You know what I mean? I don't mm. want to be spoiled to her. <laughs> I don't want to have my originality compromised by virtue of looking at other stuff. And then other people yeah. happily swim in in the middle of influence and all the time. You know what I mean? Or they're just yeah. I mean, like I think it is a real risk. I think that you start to become affected by what you're seeing, or you start to be affected by like fashion. You know. Um, there's definitely within photography there's like uh, things that become very fashionable for want of I mean it doesn't mean it's bad photography it's just like um, but I can't I can't help myself I, I get so excited when I see work that seems fresh and like um, so I'm kind of addicted to Instagram and everything else but um, I do spend a lot of time on edits um, and on books and things so I think at the end of the day it kind of turns into its own thing um, or like images that I might have liked for certain reasons, reasons tend to fall off because it doesn't work, whatever. So, um, yeah, I'm I'm not pure, unfortunately. I can't like um, I can't like I can't be like that. I'm not listen, looking at anything, but I do worry sometimes that I am infected by by what's current or what's um, what's trendy at the time, for sure. So it's a kind of checking of yourself in a way against yeah against that. I mean, it's even like. Yeah, like, I mean, it was even like I had an exhibition there with another Irish photographer and he was showing me work that it was in progress. And then I had a, I had a little book project as well that I was showing and he was going, oh man, like, you know, that, that I must have seen, that's where I saw that photo of like a chair or whatever. And uh, he was like, oh, I know, because you sent me that PDF. So I'm just after subliminally putting it into my edit. And I was like, well, no, because like chairs are kind of a trope, you know, like, there's, a, there's only a couple of ways of photographing a chair and like they, they mean things. So that's why people like them. So it's, it, it, I think you have to be just kept, like you have to be constantly aware of that, that, you know, are you sort of question yourself all the time as to whether. But, but you, at the same time, you can't be hobbled by it. No, I think, yeah, I think, yeah. 
like I'm kind of like do it all and then edit it out later you know with time it kind of you start to see those things a bit clearer with time because you fall out of love with them a little bit so um yeah and the fashions move on you know 